The Lives of the Saints by Reverend Alvin Butler Taken from the fourth edition published in 1954 The Venerable Marie Therese Hayes Founders of the Daughters of the Cross Belgium The cockpit of Europe, the land reminiscent of wars long before the days of Stern's Uncle Toby and the Army, which swore so dreadfully in Flanders. Down to the Napoleonic drama of the Hundred Days to the Titanic Conflict, which convulsed the world 1914 till 1918, is no less remarkable for another kind of warfare with its attendant heroes, heroines and saints. In the very forefront of this great spiritual army must be reckoned the Congregation of the Daughters of the Cross, which ever since 1833 has for nearly a century carried on its manifold labors in schools, hospitals, prisons and penitentiaries, not only in Europe, but in almost every part of the world where religion, instruction or charity have called for the exercise of its seal. In 1782, there was living in Liège a gentleman named Louis Hayes, who was attached to the court of the Prince Bishop, one of those stately prelates, doubtless of the 18th century, whose ceremonious grandeur has added not a little to the showy pageantry of that somewhat meretricious epoch. M. Hayes and his wife, Marguerite Tombeur, had six children, and of these, Jean, born 27th of February 1782, is the subject of this notice. From the first, she was remarkable for great sweetness of disposition, but also for a certain assertiveness, which made her the leader of her young companions in all their amusements and pastimes. She and her sister, Fernand, liked nothing better than to dress up as nuns, taking, no doubt, as their models the sister of a Benedictine convent in the neighborhood, which they visited occasionally with their mother. The abbess of the convent, a woman of remarkable shrewdness, as indeed most reverend mothers appear to be, said to Madame Hayes on one occasion with reference to little Jean, Believe me, that child will one day be an abbess. That day, however, was long in coming, and many were the momentous happenings that were destined to precede it. In 1792, the French revolutionary armies invaded Belgium, then part of the Austrian dominions, and began those impieties and devastations everywhere associated with the enforced propaganda of the rights of man. In an incredibly short time, the most peaceful people in Europe were in a state of violent commotion. Many of the better classes took to flight with whatever they could carry with them, while in the south of the hardy rustic population was facing the godless soldiers of Valmy and Jemap with fowling pieces and pitchforks in a La Vendée kind of struggle which has been so vividly described by Henry Conscience in Viva or the War of the Peasants. M. Hayes, as one of the proscribed aristocrats, after very nearly falling a victim to the La Lanterne, had to abandon his home with his wife and children, and so sudden was the flight that in the confusion of the general exodus, the various members of the household became separated, and for some years they suffered the additional hardships of a divided exile. M. Hayes, in fact, never saw his beloved ones again, dying in Germany before the happy reunion could be effected. Jean and her sisters, Fernand, though, separated from their parents, fell into the hands of some good people and were well cared for, but it was not till after the lapse of several years that they could rejoin their mother and return to Liège. The hard experiences caused by the revolutionary invasion were no doubt an excellent preparation for the future founders of the Daughters of the Cross. One of the great needs of Belgium like France, at that time of reconstruction after the social deluge, was Christian education. The Catholic orders and their schools having been swept away and no new religious community having taken their place, the nation was confronted with the dismal prospect of state secularism in the training of the young with all its baleful results. Thoroughly believing on the practical proverb that an ounce of help is worth a ton of pity, Jean and her sisters, now both young women, resolved to do what they could in their own immediate circle. They opened a school for children of the middle class in Liège, where sound religious instruction was imparted together with the usual subjects of a superior education. So successful was the venture that they were soon asked by the authorities to take over the management of the parish school of Saint-Bartholomew. Sacrificing their own feelings and interests, 
The sisters consented, and before long their efforts in this new sphere of labor had resulted in a social betterment that was manifest all over the city. But excellent as may be the effects of well-directed individual labor, these must of necessity perish with those who inaugurate the work, and hence the wisdom underlying the foundation of the religious orders in which practical good is not only achieved but perpetuated from age to age. The great object of Mademoiselle Hayes and her sisters was to found an institute of religious women which should devote itself to education and works of charity. But for many years the idea had to remain nothing more than a beautiful dream. Not till after the Belgian Revolution of 1830 could the project be carried out. For under the rule of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, of which Belgium formed part in accordance with the unhappy and enforced settlement by the Allied powers in 1815, no monasteries or convents could be established owing to the then strong Protestant opposition of the predominant partner Holland. But with the independence that came of the few weeks' strife, inspired largely by the July Revolution in France, all obstacles were removed. Meanwhile, the sisters had prayed much and they were confident that God had not only heard their petitions but that he had given evident indications of his will with regard to the longed-for foundation. They laid the matter before their confessor, Canon Habits, who seems to have been not only unimpressed, but who actually treated the whole affair with a certain amount of derision. For contrary to the common belief, especially in non-Catholic countries, priests are the very opposite of gradualists where spiritual manifestations are alleged, following for the most part the wise attitude of the Church, which lets, which lets time and trial test all things before cleaving to that which is good. Like the women in the Gospel, however, Mademoiselle Hayes persevered and among the first converts won by her holy persistence was the hostile confessor himself. With the approval of the Bishop of Liège, arrangements were ere long made for the inauguration of the new work on the 8th of September, the Feast of the Nativity of Our Lady, 1833, Jean and Fernand Hayes and five postulants were clothed by the Bishop of the Diocese with the habit of the Daughters of the Cross. In few of the long years of waiting and the many trials through which they had passed, the two sisters were allowed to make the perpetual vows at once, the rest taking the temporary ones only. In spite of her great reluctance, Mademoiselle Jeanne, now Mère Marie Thérèse, was elected first Mother General of the new sisterhood, and this office was perpetuated to her by repeated re-election till her death. The congregation was formally approved by Gregory XVI in 1845. Though at first instituted for education only, the Daughters of the Cross soon undertook other and very varied good works. Thus, within a few years of 1833, they were attending to the female inmates in many hospitals, prison and penitentiaries. Soon branches of the congregation were opened in France and Germany. The first house in England was started at Cheltenham in 1863 and the next at Chelsea in August 1869. The head convent now in this country is a Karlsholten, an imposing group of buildings that has grown up around the central edifice, a fine old Caroline mansion, once the country residence of the famous Dr. Radcliffe, founder of the library at Oxford. When 80 years of age, in 1862, Mère Marie-Thérèse had the joy of seeing a band of her sisters making a foundation at Karachi, which thus became the first of many flourishing houses of the Daughters of the Cross in India. As the conscious life of the Holy Founders had begun almost amidst the upheaval and wars of the Great Revolution, so was it destined to close beneath the clouds of persecution and dispersion. The Kulturkampf campaign of Prince Bismarck against the Church in Germany, which reached its culminating point in 1875-77, till caused many poignant scenes, and not the least of these was witnessed in the latter year, when thousands of nuns and religious were exiled from the fatherland going forth many of them bearing on their habits and crosses and medals conferred by the government for heroic acts and self-sacrificing labor in field and hospital during the bloody renaissance of the German Empire in 1870 till 71. Madame Mère Therese was happily spared this last sorrow 
though it can be well imagined that so spiritual a soul and so courageous a character would have accepted the catastrophe with the same quiet and holy confidence that had carried her successfully through the crisis and difficulties of nearly a century. She passed to her reward on the 7th of January 1876, leaving behind her, as all such personages do, an inspiring legacy of deep trust in God, indomitable patience and a constant charity for the needs and afflictions of others. Indeed, the record of her life is so entirely merged in that of her foundation that there is comparatively little to detail of herself. Prayer and patience were the great weapons she relied upon to achieve good and to a wonderful understanding of and sympathy for the complexities and waywardness of human nature was joined a tenderness for the sorrows of the afflicted, whatever might be the origin of the trouble in question. The cause of her beatification was introduced at Rome in 1912, when the title of Venerable was conferred on this veritable Mulia Fortis, who will, it is hoped, be raised one day to the altars of the Church as another great example and heartening patroness of the cause of active charity on earth.